Welcome to From Hand Clapping to Water Drums, Music of Africa's Percussion Instruments. I'm Pat Nelson, and today we'll be talking with Doris Green. She is an ethnomusicologist, musician, dancer, and the founder-creator of Green Notation, a system for writing the music of percussion instruments and aligning it with accompanying dance movements in a single integrated score. Green Notation enables the percussive music of Africa to be put on paper and later reproduced from a print source. Hey, Doris, how are you today? I'm fine. Doing very well, thank you. All right. So, you are from Brooklyn, New York, originally. And... Yes, I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> Viva Brooklyn and the Dodgers. <laughs> and Jackie Robinson. And Jackie Robinson. So, what was your childhood like? Well, I look when I look back on it, I had a beautiful childhood. I have no complaints. I don't know all the misery they have today. I had I experienced none of that when I was growing up. I know I lived in a beautiful three family house which my father owned. It was I think it was the prettiest house ever in Brooklyn, even in out over there when you go on the other side where they have all those lovely brick houses. It was just beautiful. It had kick plates on the front, brass, you had to polish those every week and you had that nice glass that you that you see in churches in the vestibule, mm-hmm. and I, it was just a gorgeous house. Oh. Deep, dark, mahogany steps and everything else. It was gorgeous. That was that. And we used to play in the front yard, myself and my sisters. And that. And we had a lovely time. And how did dance enter into your life in that beautiful childhood? <laughs> Generally, when they say, how did dance enter into your life? And I, they say, well, she moves well, so give her dance, dancing lessons. My mother always wanted us to to have something to do to keep us out of harm's way. So I was given music and dance lessons from grade school. So that's how that into that, and I went on doing it. All right. We went to the same high school, although a couple of decades apart, at Prospect Heights High School. Oh, yes, Prospect Heights High School. <laughs> I remember Prospect that. High I used to have a thing. And I said, since I, my specialty was always moving in the way that my, I thought my ancestors moved, even though at the time I didn't know where my ancestors were from and probably still don't know, but I love to move in that fashion. So at Mary Bruce's dance studio, I got the opportunity to dance to the Congo drum, the beat of the Congo drums, and they liked it so much, they gave me a, a solo thing to do in the Carnegie Hall concert that we held every year. It's called Queen of the Jungle Miss. I used to get out there and I used to move every piece of the body. Your arms would go one way, feet another way, neck another way, everything was that. But I couldn't even do do that in school because it would look too suggestive according to the other folks. So I said, okay, fine, I'll just do the tap and that's about that. So that's how it is. And when did you make the decision to focus specifically on African dance? Was it after high school? No, it was during high school. I used to sit in the park and listen to the drummer's drum, and they would grunt and hit different parts of the drum, and I'm looking at that, and they wouldn't teach you how to play. So you have to depend upon your ears to do these things for you. So I would sit up there, and they would always play the same thing. I said, hmm, that must be popular. But that was among the Latin people. Most of the time, they would be the ones playing the Congo drums in the park and so forth so, and on the beach. So I would listen to that. And I love to move in a certain fashion, so I just kept on doing that. And I put it together, and after I was doing that, I did, created the Queen of the Jungle Mist. I used to do that each and every year for the concert. And I just kept on doing it, and that was that. Mm-hmm. And you also taught uh, at Brooklyn College and other places, and you got awarded the Fulbright Scholarship. That's major. Oh, that comes in. That, that was when um, the Timmy of Eddie, the late Timmy of Eddie, Oba Adeto, yes, Laoye the first. He, through some miracle, understood that I could write African music. And I think they had some relatives in the UN and they had some Nigerians were living in my house and they contacted them and then they sent the man over to me and he talked to that and then he got back to the Timmy of Ede and I got a letter from the Timmy of Ede say he wanted me to come to Nigeria and put the Igben set of drums 
Yoruba Igbin set of drums into written form, and that was about that. So that's how he got on that. And um, I was always still, I was still teaching. I was still teaching in in, the, in Mary Bruce's school and all those type of things until I uh, went into until I graduated from high school, and then I joined all the Tunji's group, and I loved that. Uh, and he already lived a few blocks away from us, and that was that. So we knew both Amy and, uh, and Baba Tunji all the Tunji personally, and so that's how. And I just kept on going. And they would do these different dances, Fanga and Patakato were the dancers of the rage at that particular time, so forth and so on. And I continued doing that. And I studied the Yoruba language with him and everything else, and I just kept up. And I said to myself, there must be a way where you can write these company dances. And nobody knew of anything. There was, I would hear a whisper here and a whisper here. And I said, nah, that's not, that's not going to work. And then my girl, I was coming home on the subway, and my girlfriend up to live in the next block, she said, well, how is uh, writing uh, the dances coming along? And I said, you know, it's very difficult. And I can't seem to find anybody that knows anything about writing dance movements. So she said, you know, Brooklyn College is offering for the first time this fall, 1962, Lab Notation, a course whereby you can write dance movements. She said it was too late for her because she was graduating and that I should go. And I applied for Brooklyn College, and overnight, I became a college student. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Over wow. there, that's it. I'm gone. And, I said, and I got there. They, said, they didn't didn't want to accept me. So I went, oh, you filed too late. I said, you must be drunk. I have um, <laughs> this post office <laughs> certificate that I filed by application in time. So how are you going to tell me that? You better get that $40 a week clerk out of the office. I said, well, then, you know, I'm a fighter. Now I'm from Brooklyn. Don't mess with me. And so I got into it and I came in. He said, "Oh, you're kind of old, so we don't know if we'll be uh, you will be able to complete the program." I said, "Well, and, and for that I'll knock your socks off." <laughs> they, they didn't know me. Uh-uh. I'm a person of my word, and I'm determined to do what I want to do. So I came in and I joined the dance club, and I showed them how I could play the drums and everything else, and accompany myself and doing that. And so it, it caught on, and everything like that. then throughout the years of doing that, see, I was a commercial student in high school. But in order to get into college, you had to have the academic credit, and I didn't have that. So that meant a third year of a language and two and a half years of academic math. Oh, God, that meant I had to go to school at night. Couldn't even go in the day. Pay for my courses until I feel fulfilled that they can see, and then I could come in the daytime. And it was rough. Now, imagine working all day as a, as a secretary and uh, mm-hmm. then going to school at night. I had to cut my lunch hour in half. And then we meant beat it down that track on my two inch high high heels and fly up there and get on the train so I could get down to Flatbush Avenue so I could cross across at that one light. If you didn't make it in the beginning, you could just forget it. You'd probably die crossing <laughs> that street and Franklin and North Street Avenue just to go to the shop so I could get something to eat and then go join my classes. That's how that went. Wow. And, and back in the day, you know, for both of us, uh, the the curriculum in high school was divided up into academic, commercial, and vocational. Mm-hmm. And I graduated in 73, and the following year, they merged everything together so that everybody took everything. So it was no longer the academic track, the commercial track, the uh, vocational track. So, yeah. <laughs> that too late for me. I know, too. (laughs) It came too late for me, too. But, you know, it's just interesting how things really have uh, changed and how a lot they haven't changed much. So you did those classes, you got the Laban notation, and then how did you move from Laban notation to Green notation? Well, you see, it's the type of thing when she said that they were given the course in writing uh, dance movements. Uh, no, but I go back to that. See, when I was in high school, when I was doing stenography, and uh, the teacher came in one day and she wrote on the board M and then a way, the way sign, which was the W sign, and it would say May we. And may we, we always thought that was a polite way of saying, well, maybe leave the room, maybe do this, maybe that. She said, no, that's written in the French language, and it has a totally different meaning, even though the symbols are the same. The symbols are the same for the sound. It's a different meaning. So I said, wait a minute. If they can do that, then why not write drum sounds? I said, every time they play something, they make some kind of noise. So I said, okay, fine. So I took the word for drum out of treatment, took that one symbol, the D, R, and the M, I took that, I knocked off the R hook, and I took off the M, and so I had a D stroke, which represented the tones on the, a tone on the drum. That's D, if it was a dark stroke, 
T if it was a light stroke. So right then and there, I had light and dark for his ways of hitting the drums. So I had bass and I had trouble and sort of thing. So that's how it started. And then when I wanted to slap the drum, I took the M and reattached it. And that then, no, I took the M and reattached it. So that means so I had that and a pause. Uh, pause, and then I had the accent sign for music, which meant slap the drum. So that's how it went originally. So my original symbols were, uh, the sounds were, were do 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 dum jack, and that's how I had it. And then when I closed the book that day, no one knew what I was doing, and that was it. That was the, my first drum sound that I had written. And so I continued to work with that until I was able to get greater exposure, you know, traveling around, going to different islands and things like that, because I was a great player of the steel pond and all that. I used to go and play that, the ping pong and all that. So I, I was getting into that. And so I said, well, I, I could notate this, I could notate that. And so I just kept on going. And one thing led to another and so forth and so on. That's how I came from Pittman to Laban, because they were basically the same thing. Pittman and Laban are based upon light and dark shadings. They're also based upon the circle. So that, that it was just right there. And I said, and that's a part of it, uh, being natural. So I took it and that was that. So I started creating this, the drum sounds. And, and when, and I was going to say, and when was the first time that Green notation was used in a dance. Used in a dance? Well, I would have to say um, it was in the, in the summer of 80, 182, in the summer of 82, I was working with a local group, and we went over for, went to Europe for International Year of the Child, and I was in, uh, I think, uh, Belgium or someplace like that, and... Um, I put up my notation of uh, Achabako, which is from Ghana, who originally the war, part of the war dance from Atuikwe. And I said, put that up, and I had to, well, just maybe two measures. And I had to really step, swing, kick, step, 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 and all well, that. And I put that up there, and um, I also put up dance notation, Laban, beside it, so that they could see the how the music and dance complement each other. So when they when the students came up to perform it, and I, I explained it and said, okay, this is the step that they're doing. So I had them watching the step. And it was all these people from the convention and the that, and they were looking. Then someone said, I don't see all the movement that they're doing. I said, well, I didn't really want to clutter the sample, so I'm just giving you the basic movements and so forth and so on. I always said, always be at your best when you go out there because you don't know who knows what, and they may know what you know, and maybe something that you don't know. So I said, always put your best foot forward. And so when the people came down to talk to us at the end of the thing, the lady came to me, and she was dancing in front of me, and she said, I'm Ann Hutchinson. I almost collapsed. She's the one who wrote the book on live notation. <laughs> she looked me dead in the face. <laughs> oh, God. I said, I knew when wow. somebody said, I don't see all that movement. Somebody knew what I knew. <laughs> and that was it. That's how I met her in, in um, I think, August of 1982. Wow. And she started to work with me on the symbols and things like that. And then years later, uh, Jill Beck brought me into Dance Notation Bureau, and I stayed there working on the elementary intermediate dance teaching, and reading, and advanced courses, and that. pretty rough. And then I wrote for the Dance Notation Journal and all, because this is something new. I mean, you know, mm -mm. People didn't even want to look at me and say, uh-uh, what is that? And then I said, okay, fine, I'm going to show you something. So I was showing one, and then Jane married him, so she said, I will help you with it. And she said, when I did, gave the demonstration, she fell back. I guess she said, how the hell does the body move in all those different directions? What's <laughs> 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 head going one way, legs going another way, arms going another way, chest going. <laughs> and then, so she sat down to me and said, okay, fine. So I said, I started working on that, a labor of love. I just kept working on it, and that's it. So every dance that I came across, when I studied in Africa from 1970 on, I, every dance that I came across, I made sure that I put that down as best I could. And then when I did lab notation, of course, so I did everything in, in lab notation. And it's not an easy task because everything in Africa is different. Every group is different. And theirs is ruled by the music, which is ruled by the language. And I said, oh, Lord. And then I don't know if there's anything. Oh, this is complex. 
when you sit down there and if you hear the sound, nu vivi la dame, dame, nu vivi la dame, dame, you don't know what that means. But that's a nasty drummer. He's, he's saying, nu vivi la dame, dame. Nu vivi is a girl. No, I don't want to tell you what la dame is. When you mix those two, he's asking to go to bed with you. Yeah, oh boy. You heard, you heard. <laughs> <laughs> nasty drummer. <laughs> nasty drummer. Uh, there are three pieces on your website, www.greennotation.com, and I wonder if you could talk about each of them a little bit. Oh, which ones are you referring to now? Let me get There's the one with the, the Saba, oh, okay. uh, the Tokwe, and, the, and then the one with the A that I always miss. <laughs> A-G-B-A-D-Z-A? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Thank let's you. start let's start with the, the Saba. Saba is the national dance of Senegal. When the Senegalese came here for the first time in October nineteen seventy one, they appeared at the Brooklyn Academy of Music in a show that actually exposed people to dances of the world and it was Senegal, uh let's see Morocco, Sierra Leone and a few other troops sent in there. They were bringing dance focus in it. The Senegalese came, and before I, they came, I was already in Africa doing research. And Senegal was the last stop on my doing before coming back to the United States because I had come across the continent of Africa. So I was uh, told to meet the director of the ballet there. So I went and met the director, and I told him what I was doing, and then he said, well, my group is coming to New York in October. And if you... If you, if you refer to the Guinea Ballet, you've seen the Guinea Ballet. Yes, I've seen the Guinea Ballet. You say, well, mine is different. It's night and day. So he was talking about uh, the National Ballet of Guinea, which we call the Guinea Ballet here. And um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we started talking so forth and so on. So he said, you'll be surprised. When he came here, I'm telling you, from the opening until the curtain drew, they, they changed the way dance was, African dance was looked at, taught, perceived, and perform. I mean, it was so astounding. And this man was a genius. And he took that. They came. They opened up with a palatata, and they had the three drummers drumming, drumming in the dark. And then the first one would go play his portion. The second one would answer that, and then the third would come on. Then the lights rose up, and they came out, and they were playing. And the headdress was going, and then oh my God, in tandem. And then you never see it. People jumped up. They screamed. I'm telling you, it was something else. When that show was over, it took maybe five curtain calls for them to be able to close that stage. <laughs> they could not. And they did all. And they did Saba. Saba was it. And then you see legs going everywhere. You didn't know what the hell was this. We used to dancing in a certain fashion that comes from Nigeria and Ghana. But this, oh, Lord. <laughs> they did that and they did the dance in several regions. And they had all kinds of artists out, typically out of Senegal. They didn't have anybody else. You had to be from the Senegal region even to be in there. They had the they had Sabah, the Tuvalov people, which actually from the, the same instruments that they're using. They had the acrobats, the pull acrobats. Oh my God, that was fantastic. And the, the outfits were so great. You, I'm telling you, you've never seen anything like this in your life. And your skin would crawl. They, they were so wonderful. And that was, that's about that. From that day on, people started to march to Senegal, even though they couldn't speak French, they were gone. Gone. <laughs> they, and then wow. the next year, they, 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 did, they did so well. The people wanted to join the ballet because it's not parents and want your children to, you know, to, to become a dancer. Now, that was considered a low lively thing to do. So when they, but when they came here, like I say, you make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Boy, people clamored to get into to the National Ballet of Senegal. It was great. That's about that. And Tokwe. Tokwe. <laughs> Tokwe is out of Ghana. Now, I'm trying to figure out. Well, let's see. I don't even remember exactly what. Okay, all I remember is the beat. I learned it in maybe 1971 and recorded it there at the Arts Council of Ghana. So then that, it was a very lovely dance, lively dance that I felt. And it was easy to do and easy to do. It didn't have too much difficult, difficult, difficult rhythms in order to have it. Oh, I like that. So I, I did it and I started notating it and so forth and so on. And I said, okay. I don't know. So when I came back as a cultural specialist from the United States, cultural specialist to Ghana, I told that dance to 
have them notate, have the students and performers notate that particular dance. And I did that on a computer. So when I said, because Laban Rider now had been created, so you could write some dance movements on the computer. So I took that, and I had the students work on that, and we notated the entire dance. Now we came to do the music portion, and time ran out. <laughs> I said, oh, Lord, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll finish it. And they wanted that to be the, the first notation in the archives that they're going to create in my honor for writing African music and dance. Because I had two outstanding students that were always with me, even on the television broadcast that we did in Ghana. They were called the Breakfast Club and the, the Embassy translating, who transposed it from their particular system to ours so that we could see it. And it was very, very nice. I had two of the fellows dance the dance. I generally girls dance it, but the fellows were the one who were available for the broadcast. And or, uh, or, or do say, she was with me and, and at the chair when we were talking about it. And it was very, very nicely done. And it was it. Because now these students, they know the dance. And they started to dance it. And I said, wait a minute, that doesn't belong in there. That wasn't in there. Not in 1979. That, that comes from something else. That comes from another dance. Said, How do you know? I said, because I recorded this before you were born. And said, the music you're listening to now is the live music. And you can't say, no, 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 that's not a step. And I showed them how it really goes. And really? Now when you see it on, on, on the Internet, I said, uh-huh, they didn't the OPA or something like that. I said, well, that's nice, but they're repeating the same thing several more times in, what, in the original thing that we had done. So it's it's out there, and it's, it's, up there. it's a very, very nice dance. So that's going to be the first notated score in the archives. So that's about that. That's when you planned. Mm-hmm. And the A word. <laughs> the Agbaja. The Agbaja yes. comes from, it's part of the war dance. See, because at this particular time, they were uh, living under the uh, crude king, I guess you would call him, King Agokoli. Now, Agokoli was so mean to his people, he kept them in the compound. So one day, they devised a way that we're going to get out of his compound. So what they did was they turned around, and for days, they had been softening the wall of the compound so that it, they could, it could be broken through and they could walk out. So what they did is they turned around and walked out backwards. So people who was the sentry come by, they would think that the people were coming in when they, when they were escaping, going out backwards. So <laughs> as they as they traveled throughout these different planets from that place over to Ghana and Benin, Togo, and, and, and to finally to Ghana, so they have that. And they say that a a... Not a, a bird guided them. So you look at the movement. This is the story that they told me. When you look at the movement, how the arms go, that is how the the, the, the flight of the bird's wings in while he's traveling, flying through the air. So that's, that comes from the Opoko and them said that. So when you ever look at that dance, you see how those arms move in and out. It's kind of like what Patty LaBelle tries to do in somewhere over the rainbow, but there's much more extensive than that. That's how it is. <laughs> And then they have so that's that's called the Agbaja movement of the arms. The, actually, they call it the eagle horn. They said the bird led them to safety from where they are to, to where they are now in Ghana. So that's when you have that. And that's one of the, one of the dances they do that. Any any occasion, you can see them doing the Agbaja in the streets, and it is all part of the funeral ceremonies. But so forth, but that that's the Agbaja. It's just a very simple step. Go ahead. Yeah. And it's well it's well documented on um, on the net. I think they have some groups doing it. But what I like is the part of the processional. That's part in the processional that they do that, and that is uh, so the Agbaja, Ajabako, and all of that comes from the the Eve people in the different re- regions for that. So that's that's that particular dance. <laughs>
And now just kind of switching a little bit here, what were some of the challenges and what are some of the challenges you've had trying to get Green Notation and your work out there? The most challenging thing is that I'm a woman, and they don't like women to do, so I don't know, the same challenges we're having over here as a woman, to be the best that you can be in what you choose to be, your occupation, so forth and so on. They, they frowned upon it. Oh, God. And then as a young person, I was extremely beautiful looking. I might say so myself. And then the men would chase you from pillar to post. And that is that. I said, oh, God, I can't deal with this nonsense. It was one of there was a black fellow there, and he, he and his wife, and they would come leaving Africa after their tour, and they were going out by East Africa. And I was coming from East Africa going to West Africa. He said, the man told me, are you crazy? You're going to go to West Africa by yourself? I see here. Yeah, I have a job to do. So, mm -mm -mm. He sat down and gave me a good talking for about an hour and a half and so forth and so on. He said, what to watch out and this, that, and the other. So I listened to what he said and I mind my own business and I kept on. did was I had cultural informants in each of the countries that I was going to visit. Some were very good and some were not so good and so forth and so on. Because I remember I had, what I was, mashallah. And he, in Tanzania, he was exceptionally well. I had known him from the previous year, and he was for the cultural informant for the whole eastern region of Tanzania. So he knew his stuff, and he, I met him at the embassy. And you don't get into the embassy unless you're perfectly cleared. So when I met him and told him what I wanted to do, he said that he would work with me on it. So he worked with me on the first dance that I ever did from um, Africa on the continent of Africa. It's called Sidimba. Oh, God, that, that's a puberty dance of the Wamakonde people. That is excellent. Oh, Lord. I mean, and then the rhythm was so sparkling. And I, but I was about ready to go when I was in this this uh, festival called Siku Yugui Asaba Saba. And I was in there and said, that's like the thing that you used to have at Danbury State Fair where they bring everybody together so people will get to know each other and know each other's cultures and so forth and so on. And um, but you, people in Africa, they live so far apart. Sometimes they don't even know what their neighbors look like. They don't know their language and they don't know their particular dances. So they had these people coming together. And I was so bored with some of the stuff. I said, ah, that's not great. And I got ready to leave and I heard, whoa, 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 like, listen, that rhythm is something else. <laughs> so I ran back there, threw my tape recorder on, and I sat there and I was watching this dance that they was coming in. They came in with their drums and their xylophones and, 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 and marimbas and everything on there. And then they had this big banner thing tied around their, their hips and so forth and so on. And I said, they're watching that step carefully, executing it as they were doing it, da, 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 and moving my feet. So then they would point to the leader and then point to me. And I stopped. I stand still because I don't know what was going to happen. Mm -hmm, tell me this. And that's about that. So I kept on doing that. And finally, they caught me doing it. And they dragged me into the middle and had me dancing with them. Boy, I danced that dance like that. I got have been dancing it forever. Oh, it was great, CD and Bob. That people did dance for the Wamakonde people. And so that was that. They called that the hands on. And they had me on. So every day that I come, I will always practice that. And I went back to go to the different villages all the way down to Shagom to, to take to to look at that and take different groups doing it. Because Washawana Mashala had a group of Telenelele Utamadoni troop at the time. And they were appearing in, in one of the places in Arusha, which is a long distance from Daza, from Dar es Salaam. But we went up there to see them performing and all. It's very, very exciting. And this is the type of movement you don't see in almost every other day. And then I took it and I taught it to uh, Billy when he came in, when I brought him here to teach in NYU. And I shared it with him, shared most of my stuff with him, unfortunately. And then uh, we went to, when I came to Senegal, I mean, when I came to Ghana, he, and I taught it to the people in Ghana and so forth and so on. But then they started to get over over eager, they would take some of the students there took it to Europe and they claim all of this and all of that. Oh, we studied, we did original research on this particular dance and so forth and so on. And they just kept on talking, talking, talking. And I said to myself, wait a minute, they're talking about Sedima. And so on. And I kept on saying, then I asked questions. What is the rhythm of Ntoyi drum? What was the name of the uh, other drum, Lingo and Lingonia? Uh, what was it, Makomba? They didn't know any of these things. And then so I, when I kept questioning that, what was the rhythm of this, what was the rhythm, then somebody hit the man in the side who was doing all this boasting. Remember, we were sitting in the lunchroom uh, between shows, and when he hit him in the side, he said, shut up, shut up. I said, what do you need to know? They take a look at the face. She might be a little older now, but she's the one who originally taught that dance. Everything went silent. Nobody was boasting anymore. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> you looking at the one who taught that dance. And then I thought, did not. That's who it was. And he got up and he started dancing the dance. I thought, uh-huh. That's what he thinks. We know the rhythm. Now. He didn't, Don't play with me. As I'm the one who said it. You never know who's going to be sitting there. As I said, keep your mouth shut. You never know who in that audience knows you, <laughs> knows more than you know. <laughs> that. So that was the end of that. But they had taken it. They made it. Made up their own rhythms. Is it that tough? So it, uh-uh. it wasn't. It, it wasn't only um, sexism. It was really about education level. It was about uh, having the, as they call it, the audacity to notate dance to get it. Uh, they to didn't a level notate it. They just performed it. On. They didn't notate it. No, no, it. no. Just... I mean. Because your 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 challenges in getting it out. Mm-hmm. Um, you were just mentioning someone, and you said, "Oh, it was unfortunate that this person." You know, I I shared everything. You said I shared everything with this yeah. um, person, and you said it was unfortunate. And I'm just wondering why was it unfortunate? It was unfortunate because um, at the time, African dancers just became coming to the schools in the United States through the um, act by uh, oh, President, oh God, I'm getting in the man's name now, uh, the one in there. Well, anyway, let's go back to it. Anyway, they bought it. That's when they bought in the Civil Rights Act. Uh, mm-hmm. Lyndon Baines Johnson, there you go. Is that he bought, mm-hmm. bought that in. LBJ. LBJ. So be, we had to have courses on black and minority studies in all schools with all the liberate speed, so they couldn't pull another separate but equal and all. But the thing is, that was based upon shaky ground. They really didn't get through it, and we didn't have the people comp- competent to be able to do the job. You have very so few people in there. You have myself, the Dinner Zulus, and so, people who had been to Africa who studied this and so forth and so on. And my, my work my work is, is earth-shaking. And the fact that I was willing to share it was, was not the greatest thing because then people... T- as Opoku said, people will be so excited about seeing African dances and music because this is a part of the people and their culture. They will begin to make up their own, and so the only thing recognizable will be the name of the piece, but nothing, no essence in the dance or the music. That Opoku said that himself when he was here in 1968. And I said to myself, Ooh, Lord, have mercy. And that was it. But then again, you began to see it shortly after that. And the company started coming. And people make up their own things. And that was that. So unfortunately, I shared it with him. And then he decided that he was going to take over. And he wasn't too bright because you have to know when and where you enter in somebody's life. There were so many people on my side who knew about this before I even went to Africa. And now you're going to tell anything. You created my stuff? No, 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 no. That's optimized, and that's about that. And he didn't work for women. Uh, Brooke and Kyle, that was angry at them, too, because they decided they would write him in on one of my grants because I won three faculty research awards to re- do research in Africa. And uh, the, the research bureau at Brooke and Kyle said, this is the most exciting work we've seen since we opened the research bureau. And they were openly going to sponsor me for every grant they could possibly get and so forth and that and that. But then again, they said, well, you're a woman. Now, that's their fault. I know I'm a woman. You're a woman, and it, it would be much more attractive. And the people who oversee these foundations that grant the money would be more receptive to giving it to you if a male was attached to your program. And this is when they started suggesting, oh, the turn you this one, that one. I said, no, that's not the point. Is They don't know what I know. It's what about the one you brought over here to teach it in my year? I said, he doesn't know what I know. I'm sharing my things with him. And they wrote him in against my better judgment. And then when they met him, they said, oh, I believe you're right. We made a mistake. But it was too late then. And that was that. Wow. And you referred to a lot of countries that you were able to visit. Uh, I, I heard Senegal and Ghana and Tanzania and Uganda. any other one. Uganda. Uganda. Tanzania, mm-hmm. Uganda, Kenya. I went to school in Kenya. It was one of my first things. It was over in Kenya where we had um, the International Institute of Education started to take teachers over because many of the teachers who were assigned to teach in these new tracks and new courses were not. They had never been to Africa, had never had the exposure, not even as much as I had because I was 
you know, self-trained and all of that. I knew a lot of Africans at the time. So we went over as a group of teachers to study there and so forth and so on. So we went there and then we had that and then we had homestay with the Africans and the Americans were complaining, this, that, and the other. You are complaining about this, that, no, no, no. We don't even have running water in our villages. Uh-oh. <laughs> we're in trouble. <laughs> it says that we come from a lifestyle that is so different from what they're used to. And that was that. So and then I went over from there. I went to uh, what's that place up there? Uh, the one that I like has a really funny name, Addis Ababa. I don't know who it is. I love that because I love Ethiopia. Addis Ababa, yeah, Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. And then I come down to uh, uh, straight across the continent, starting from all the way over, and then I first up uh, Kinshasa, in, uh, and then you go from Kinshasa, Nigeria. And it wasn't was called Benin at the time. It was called Daome. Oh, God, they have some beautiful okay. music. Oh, jeez. Mm-hmm. They have some beautiful music with the um, the bells, bells ensemble. Oh, mm-hmm. my God. And they listen to that. Oh, my God. Because there's a record called Music Daome. And then that was that won some kind of award. I think the Okora Award. And it was fantastic. They had the music of the um, Lala and Lekas and all of that. And Water Drum. Oh, you didn't hear water drum playing. So what the devil is that? All you could do is hear the sound, but they didn't have any pictures or anything else to go along with that. And then out of there, you go from there to Togo, Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Gambia, Guinea Bissau, Guinea, Senegal. And Mali, well, Mali was in later, but Mali and then Morocco. Uh, there was a whole lot of countries, even down to the one that not Nigeria, but Niger is what you know that one. Niger. So all of those things. So it's very, very nice. Each one is completely different. And so even I was in Nigeria, um, the people in Nigeria, in, in um, what do they call that, Lagos, which is no longer the capital, um, they didn't even know the people who live in there because at that time I think Nigeria was divided into 12 states. So they would invite people from different mm-hmm. states to come down to perform for them so they could see their cultures and everything else. And as again, just something like the Danbury State Fair, they brought the people in and was able to watch the, the performances and things like that. So it was very, very nice. I got an opportunity to do that too. It's just so much to do that you can't do it in, all in one thing. You have to do like you do, go back for um be a cultural specialist or a Fulbright awards. And I lost, what, two or three Fulbrights because uh, Nigeria is having a coup. I lost the first one, I think, in the early 70s when then the Timmy Reddy had invited me. The next thing I know, I, I was accepted. The next thing you know, rejection, <laughs> coup, forget it. Water going to go as fast as water comes out the faucet. And that was it. That was gone. That's sad. <laughs> I remember demonstrating my talking drum for the Duro Ladipo. That's that. And uh, he came here for a show and I said, I'm going to talk to this man. And I brought my drums with me and I brought my notation and I set it up and I said, this is how it goes. And I played, uh, I think, Bamaya or uh, Dok, uh, no, Bamaya and Nohoa to him. And I took the drum and I do boom, do boom, 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 boom. And then I did the dance. Doom, 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 doom. He said, what? <laughs> he told him, and I came here. He told him, this is one of his drums, come here. And he explained something to him in Europe, which I didn't understand all that he was saying. And then the man picked up the drum and wrote and, and played the, the samples that I put down. He said, you know what? This, I have never believed that you could write music for this. You have taken Africa's most complicated drum and you have written music for it. It's a start, no. It's not that it's a start. And I want you to come back and work with me on the Ayilu Dunda and the Bata drums. He died of brain cancer. Mm. And they had another coup, so I couldn't get to him either. I said, this is something else. So I'm still looking to ways to get there. Maybe that's now the time that we have all of this pandemic. We might be able to teach two or three groups, English-speaking groups, that is, online. And we'll be able to do that and so forth and so on. But I'm looking at that, too. So I'm, all avenues are still open. But we can't travel and talking, anywhere anyway. And mm-hmm. talking about that. What are some uh, future plans and next steps that you hope will bring renotation out into the open? The publication of the book, I already had my autobiography, was already published in 1970. That was uh, no longer an oral tradition. My Journey Through Percussion Notation, that was published. Uh, It was online. 
you can find that on the net and so forth and so on. Now, this one that's coming up soon, uh, Green Notation Manuscripts of African Music and Dance, that is that from every instrument that I played and studied, every instrument that's in the book I played, and I, I studied them so that I could actually accurately notate them. And so that's what I have on there. I have everything from hand clapping down, as you said, to water drums and so forth and so on. Not the ones that play in the water, but the ones we play outside of the water with water in them. <laughs> that's it. And that, that should be coming out soon. Hopefully by the end of the year or the early next year that we'll have that out there. And they're trying to put some things on the net, uh, such as uh, what we're doing now, this project, and getting more of those things. But I do have my um, website is out there so they can see many of the things on the website and so forth and so on to get more samples of uh, the work that I have uh, recorded at the time so they can hear those things too. Hopefully you can get that out. And that's about that. And that's about that. Mm -hmm. Doris Green, as always, thank you so very much for this time. And uh, we'll get this out on YouTube and we'll see and go uh, take it from there. So this has been From Hand Clapping to Water Drums, Music of Africa's Percussion Instruments. And you have heard a conversation with Doris Green who is an ethnomusicologist, musician, dancer, and all-around bon vivant. (laughs) And she is the founder and creator of Green Notation, a system for writing the music of percussion and instruments and for African dance in total. So thank you so very much, and see you all next time. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I was happy to speak. More people, the more people who learn in it. And the title, From Hand Clapping to Water Drums, that principally says that many of these instruments, most of these instruments in this category are the instruments that women play, not the ones that men play. And we have another program coming up. I would love to hear more about the women in the movement. So thanks again. You're welcome.